this is one of my favorite topics, and it's and it's a new topic for me, and probably for all of us. And it's um, it's interesting um, because. It feels like, you know, we've always sort of wanted to know what was in our genetics. And we, we throw that around as though that was sort of this hard and fast reality that couldn't be changed. And I think that um, the, the, more, the more sophisticated technology that we get that has allowed us to really delve into the tr truth about genetics. And, and so I've read the big book called The Gene. Um, that's a wonderful history of all of our thinking. And what I was struck by was, again, this, this kind of scientific unilateral one cause, one effect idea that has permeated even this very, this very complicated and specific science. And so what I thought I would do today is, or what my slides will do again so that you don't have to take notes or anything, but I think it's useful to kind of go through how we got to this place and what the pitfalls have been both since we mapped the human genome and then um, before we mapped the human genome, what we hoped to find. And so I think if you understand, I think that what I'd like to do with this lecture is to just lay it out about how, where we are with the science in a very uh, lighthearted and not too detailed way. And then think about it as you read about genetics and as you are offered uh, genetic testing as the be all and the end all, because the whole point in biologic, uh, in bioregulatory medicine, is that there is no be all and end all. End all, you know. So Ian said so compellingly that you know Bruce Lipton has shown us that our we our behavior and beliefs can change genes. And if you say that too loudly to one of these geneticists, then they're like, well, that's just complicating. You know, that is sort of like, it just sort of can't be so. So. Um, I think that the first time that I came across working with genes was long before we were doing this kind of testing, when women would come into my office, be, with particularly with the ovarian cancer tendency. Um, you know, there are women who are in their 20s or 30s who grow up knowing that their mother and their grandmother and a maternal aunt and sometimes a paternal aunt has this, you know, genetic tendency for ovarian cancer. Um, and the, the you know, traditional treatment for that as a prevention is to take out the ovaries, take off the breasts, and put the women on tamoxifen. And they do that when these women are 20 or 25. And so you can imagine that people would come in saying, but otherwise you die this horrible death of ovarian cancer at an early age. And that was sort of the map of it. And so when I was in Santa Fe, I. I took on a lot of women for, you know, with, I mean, I took on several families, also a breast cancer uh, gene family where when you looked at the family tree, it was just overwhelming. But again, before I really knew that, sort of knew what we're now calling epigenetics, I did know that if we change up that terrain and if we make you as healthy as we can make you, that indeed you could probably um, not get the cancer, and in, in the, as far as I know, both of those families that I worked with, that was true. But it's a big thing to do, too. You know, if you have this really horrible disease, and you know ovarian cancer is a silent cancer, and that's what makes it so insidious, which is that there's no real symptoms, and that young women get ovarian cancer, and, and the prognosis is worse than, than any other, it's often worse than any other kind of cancer. And so for me and the woman to agree that we would do everything we could short of all this surgery, it's a big step because you, you, know, you don't want to let anybody down. So um, it was just an interesting precursor. But the most interesting part that I wanted to say was at one point I had a woman who came in who said that she had a genetic pattern of like domestic violence. I, I giggle because it was so sort of horrible and that, that so many of her family members had, had been violent within their family and had passed that on. And then, you know, the women and the men would attract violent and violent people. And so she wanted to know if I could help her fix that pattern. And um, we worked on it. I don't know exactly, but she was really at the, so it's another interesting idea that, that it's true that we know that behaviors and that tendencies and characteristics can also be stopped. And she had done a lot of family history work and said, you know, this is a, this is a way I want to be different in my family. So we worked on that as well. And that's just to sort of pique your imagination about how powerful regulatory medicine can be. 
So these are quick little reminders from probably what you, as much as you learned in biology in 10th um, grade. But I have to say a word. I like, we all like to talk about the historians. Mendel was a remarkable man. Mendel was a Franciscan um, monk who, and in those days, you know, you, you, you were, you were educated to a certain degree, but it was a very quiet kind of monastic life, and he was, you know, lonesome, didn't have a lot of family around, but he was really carefully understanding these pea plants, and evidently he had huge fields. They have beautiful flowers of different colors, and he, he did these really specific experiments, but he had to keep incredible records, you know, and in order to so he was trying to figure out how to pass on genetic traits, and in order to do that, you had to clean, you had to sort of harvest the, um, the seeds, the male part of the plant from the stamens, and then you had to put them together with the female part of the plant, and you had to do that just, I guess not with even a Q-tip, but with a brush. I mean, it was really specific, and if you got the wrong little pieces of the reproductive parts, then the whole thing would be ruined. But um, he knew from those experiments that the word, that there was some sort of a, um, something that was passed on, some sort of an idea of inheritance. And it's interesting because we didn't really understand what that was for a very long time. And so these are some other people and sort of the way that we sort of stepwise went through this. This man named Beadle solved the mechanism of action of a gene, so he knew that it had to do with specifying the structure of a protein, some of you may not be knowing that, but I mean that's an important part of this because it's very precise. And then of course Watson and Crick and Franklin, who was a woman and didn't get much credit, discovered that the structure of DNA, which is the, repro the that's the, the part of the genetic code that can be translated, was a double helix, and so that was an interesting piece of the book. And what's also interesting about that, this was in very recent history that we actually determined this, was that it was a really, really mean-spirited um, fight. And starting with Watson and Crick, at least, there, there was a lot of meanness and cutting each other off, and people were hurrying to, to publish the paper, and then they were, they were set, they would realize that another scientist in another country had, was maybe close to the same thing, and then they would do something to sabotage the whole business, like dump, you know, have water accidents on their papers and make sure that they didn't get it. So it's interesting because, yeah, it, usually in science we would think that ideas would be um, shared. So then we, under, we understood that RNA is a form of, is, is the copy molecule for DNA, and that you need that for translating the genetic message. This was an interesting piece too. So if all of you remember, the chemical structure for genes is DNA, and DNA is inside the um, nucleus of cells. It's not the only place it is, but that it's it's a it's um, you know a map. And we now know that DNA is really really simple. So that means in the genetic alphabet, there's only four letters, and these are the four letters. They're nucleic acids. They have a very specific um, uh, they have a very specific form, and they're, they're all the same. And what was really interesting was that when people were, were zeroing in on the fact that DNA only had four letters, that our entire code and all the ways in which we could pass genetic information on, which of course is the way that when I was talking about the Gaia principle, that's really the way that since the beginning of time we've kind of had a continuum. It, it's, sort of mind-boggling to imagine that there's just four letters and that the, the people who, who sort of saw that there were only four nucleic acids thought it was absolutely stupid because nature couldn't be that simple. And I think we as biological, bioregulatory medicine people remember that there is sort of a, a, a cleanness and a simplicity to health. It's just that we put in all this static and that we really have a way of, you know, that, that nature is, does take the simplest way. And so, there was all these really interesting articles about how DNA is a stupid molecule, and actually it's the genetic code for anything that ever existed and everything that will exist. Um, you know, so we know that genes, this is important, we, know, we knew before, we knew the whole code that genes could be turned on and off, 
by increasing and decreasing the RNA message. And we now know that genes can be turned on and off by the microenvironment and that there are, and that the switches for turning genes on and off are sort of part of the gene. And as we were figuring out little pieces of this, we, it was all very confusing because it was hard to understand how all these little models, how all these little pieces of information would come together to be the human genome. And then in the latter part of the 20th century, there was this huge race to map the entire genome of a species. So I'm just going to go through the Book of Man because I think that um, there's p the pieces of this are interesting and that it just reminds you of what we're sort of dealing with and how even though we've mapped the human genome, it doesn't have, it has given us actually very little information of how nature uses the human genome. So we know the we know the, the, we wish that if we knew the decoding of it, that that would give us an information about the magic of the bioregulatory mechanism, but um, the two don't really match. So there are three trillion, in the human genome, there are three trillion, 88, well, never mind, you, you know, what, 88 million, 286,401 letters, four letters. There are four letters in this genetic alphabet, each made of nucleic acids. If it was published in a book with a standard font, the pages would contain only four letters and it would be 1.5 million pages long. When I hear this again, I understand that doing your 23andMe is not going to be, I know you all know this, but it's not that or any of these other things is not going to be quite as straightforward as we hope. I mean, nature is remarkable to me. So all of the human genome has, is distributed into 23 chromosomes. Apes have 24 pairs, of, I mean, 23, excuse me, pairs of chromosomes because they, unra they unravel and you get a half a, you get one chromosome from each parent. And at some point in evolution, two chromosomes in an ancestral ape fused into one. The human genome distinguished itself several million years ago. We lost a chromosome and gained a thumb. Our genome is fiercely inventive. It squeezes complexity and individuality out of simplicity. That's it for biological medicine to me. That's exactly what it is. That, you know, we just need to remember that all humans can heal and that it is getting very complex from all the input. But this, this four letters, um, you know, determine all of our genetics. It produces a near infinite functional variation out of its very limited four-letter rep repertoire. And it is really the ingenuity of our genome that is the secret to complexity and individuality. The three billion DNA letters in the human, human genome, one of the other doctors said this the other day, encode about 20,000 genes, which is only 1,700 more than worms. So that's a good thing to do if you want to humble somebody. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so what I'm saying is even the numbers and the, and the complexity, they don't match in our heads because our genome has 12,000 genes fewer than corn and 25,000 um, genes fewer than rice or wheat, which makes me think that maybe the reason we're allergic to wheat is because it just has quite so many genes. The difference between a human and a hamburger bun I'm sorry, this came, out of, this came out of an article I read, but again, humbling, is not the number of genes, but what we do with them. You know, so remember how I was talking about the matrix as being chaotic and adopt, adaptive and dynamic. Those are three words to think of a, you know, a, a system of, uh, that we can impact, uh, you know, that's kind of fluid and moving all the time and energetic. And so the human genome is exactly those things. So in some cell lines, the, gen the genetic material reshuffles itself. This is an interesting thing. Imagine reshuffling itself to make, vari to make novel variants of itself. And so what we're interested in is where does the message or the information come for genes to reshuffle themselves and make novel variations? So for example, immune cells is a good example for those of us who know this kind of detail of immunity. Immune cells actually make antibodies against the, an the, the pathogens that, that are presented. And if the pathogens change, which they do all the time, um, so, ha so do the antibodies. Genes can be activated and deactivated. And gene expression, which is this concept of epigenetics, 
is fluid and ever-changing. And so all of us have heard epigenetics, and I think we all know that means that, that you can modify the expression of your genes. But another way that I like to think about it is that the epigenetic, that the change between a newborn and a two-year-old and a 12-year-old that each of us did is epigenetic change. So there's also something epigenetic that's happening you know, with, with growth and development and then what we eventually call aging, but also with um, people who, you know, are obese and out of shape and then they start looking young and fit and, and their chi changes as well. That's an epigenetic change. So, you know, this is where the, this is where the essence is for me in understanding how we can understand genes and use and, and regulate them to, to make lasting change. But I think we think of epigenetic changes as being something much more complicated than, than the change that you go through if you really clean up your environment and you start looking fit. You haven't, young, you haven't, you haven't become more youthful, but you've definitely changed your epigenetic outcome. And that's kind of what, what going from sickness to health, how that actually is modified at the bottom level. And it's all this information and sharing of information. And remember, that when we're talking about the mesenchyme or the matrix, the message becomes the messenger, and then you need a new message. 98% of the human genome does not contain genes. I don't know what to make of that, but that's true. So what the, what the geneticists say is therefore that the, all these spaces in the gene is useless, but we know better than that. That's what the scientists always think because we don't know what it does or it doesn't contain genes, then we assume it has no use, but we'll have to keep our eye out on that one. And there are, that means that there's enormous stretches of DNA interspersed between the genes that again, the geneticists say have no function, but again, I, I think that we're gonna, I think we're wrong about that because nature doesn't do things like that. Maybe the function is to, to allow, you know, rearranging so that you can, so that biological medicine will take over at some point. The length of the genome, if unwound in a single line, would be 3,500 miles long, and only 70 of those miles is DNA that carries genetic information. So the reason I like to go through these ideas is just because they, they are almost too big to get your heads around. It's encrusted with both history and her story. Um, and contains ancient fragments of DNA that were inserted into the genome millions of years ago and have been passively carried forward. And this is actually an emerging interest uh, in genes to me because we know that the genome um, has shifted since the beginning of time to drop genes that don't mean anything. But there's some that the scientists, people are, who study this are really interested in because there's these sections that have been kept since the beginning of time. And so again, those will have meaning. And who knows, maybe that has something to do with why we can affect epigenetic change without really understanding the exact sequence. So the human genome has repeated sequences that appear frequently with no apparent function, and I think apparent is very important. So a 300 base pair, that's a G and a C together and an A and a T, that's just the way that they're wound up, um, can all of a sudden come like, ten, like um, tens of thousands of times in one little section. So it's really interesting when you go back to understanding what we actually know about this map, that it, it isn't quite as simple as you know, testing this or that, and that gets even more complicated. Each, uh, the human genome that each of us has accommodates enough variation to make a, each of us distinct from one another, but it has enough consistency to make us a species profoundly different from chimps and bonobos, despite genomes that are 96% similar. So this is extremely complex, and it's kind of beautiful because of that to me. We've un we have unlocked the entire genome. We have a book that would be 1.5 million pages long, but we have no understanding of the genomic code. And of interest to all of us should be that, you know, you, we read lots of articles about the discovery of a gene for this or for that, but what we need to start publishing or at least thinking in terms of is that we really are changing genetic expression from sickness to health. And that, you know, 
somehow when you read about it, it's kind of like, well, we, we don't have any idea what to do about it. And it's, it, I think we're, we're successful in bioelectroy medicines. We don't really know how it, ex we, we kind of know how it works, but we know what to do, that you need to make, you know, it's all the environment and that genes express and turn themselves off according to the microenvironment. And when I read this book and several other studies about it, they keep forgetting that. They keep saying, like, we have no way of, like, changing this. This just sort of is. But then they realize that if, you know, with those agouti mice, for instance, that, you know, those are these fat, oh, well, a better one, well, now I say that one later. The agouti mice are the a very standard ones that have a genetic tendency to be fat and brown. And they're all fat and brown because they can, you know, they can manipulate rat genes to be very specific. But then if you put folate in the prenatal food, all of a sudden they're back to yellow and normal weight. And that can't be reversed. If you take the folate back out, they don't get fat and brown again. So, but what's so amazing to me is that they know that, but that they still, that, that the literature speaks as though we really don't have a lot of control over it. So, um, Genomic codes can really only be deciphered from within a specific understanding of the living matrix, and that um, is very important. So appended to each gene are DNA sequences. So the gene is what, they, what we consider a message that an RNA molecule can come over and copy and then create a protein out of. So that, a little bit complicated, but that's sort of what a gene does. But, but between the sequences that we know code for proteins are sequences that carry information about how to turn on and when and where to express the gene, so that there's a separate code for how the gene works from what the gene actually does. It's really, it's just astounding. It doesn't make sense, but it's not really supposed to. Um, but the idea that it imprints and erases chemical marks on itself in response to alterations in the environment that encodes cellular memory is really am amazing to me. And, and we know that this is true because we know that that we now know that, that genetic information does get transferred intergenerationally. And I think the most famous of those examples is that the grandchildren of, of people who starved during the Holocaust are, have a huge genetic tendency to be obese and diabetic. And so, um, that, yeah, you frown and you think, well, how does that be? But that, there's this intriguing information about how, you know, that somehow the gene understands that there's not enough food, and so then you, you, you create an offspring, but second generation offspring, I don't know anything about why this is, but second generation offspring who are now living in plenty and an ample amount of food and bad food end up having a tendency to maybe to not starve if the situation was the same as the situation, again, the environment that changed. And there's all kinds of genetic things that are now, we know, are intergenerational. So it's interesting to me. And so this is just a, um, a way of really looking to me at the, at the matrix or the, or the um, genetic, uh, I mean, the matrix or the uh, biological terrain because it's very circular and you have the genes that code for the proteins and then the proteins that create organisms and then the organisms are within environments and this concept of, epigeno of epigenomics is the idea that we can eventually change the genetic expression. Um, um, this slide I put in and I, 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 didn't, I don't have time to follow it but it's just an interesting thing. Has anybody ever heard of mitochondrial Eve before? Yeah. It's a fascinating idea, and let's have a whole nother, we just have to think about that. But so you have um, genetic material from the sperm and the egg coming together at the second of con conception, and then you have your genetic information from both your mother and your father. But the cellular material, so it, it, it's the egg, the sperm, chromo the sperm chromosome, the, the sperm genetic information enters the, the female cell. And so it's actually the female cell that has the cytoplasm, meaning all the rest of it, and then those all divide. So it's, it's interesting because this idea is that 
if you trace this down, that the cytoplasm from the maternal lineage, this is not about who's superior or which parent dictates, it's about the idea that the cytoplasm from the maternal line is what's reproduced over and over, and the cytoplasm is, is full of information and a microenvironment. Is there enough of each of the micronutrients and all of the vitamins and everything? And so it makes it even more important to me that um, there's, not even, there's not even a combination of information. There's not even the best of both worlds there. But there was a lot of information about how, you know, if you have sons, if you have, if mothers have only sons, then their mitochondrial information never gets passed on, and so eventually you can go back to a mitochondrial Eve. That was kind of the idea of it, and so if you drew it, you would understand it. But I think it's an interesting piece, and I'm not going to say much more about it. So to understand the genome, this was back to Sir William Osler, who is somebody who is a very wise, very, very wise philosophical physician in the 20s. I don't know, yeah, about. And, um, you know, he, this was long before. We were just, we were just totally confused about how this ap actually happened. We knew that things were genetically passed, but we didn't know how. But he, he said, variability is the law of life. And as no two phases are the same, so, new, so are no two bodies alike. And no two individuals react alike, behave alike, and under the same abnormal con con under, to behave alike as, sorry, behave alike under the abnormal conditions which we know as disease. And so really he's touching on the fact that that internal milieu makes all the difference. So now I'm going to talk about um, a specific syndrome that has a lot of genetic consequences. So this is, this D. George syndrome is, uh, is one of the genetic patterns of disease, a very serious disease that um, kids are born with. And these kids struggle in lots of other, uh, lots of ways. And it's a, it's a dominant trait, which means that it's sort of more likely to pass down um, just from one parent. And what's interesting is that the, that the, um, that there are a hundred different, 180 in one genetic disease, there, the literature says there's 180 different anomalies, which means certain kinds of abnormalities that have been reported. So it's not very specific, actually, because if you read about families with the George syndrome, some people are very little affected, and some people are terribly affected. So problems include cardiac anomalies. That's all the different ways you can have a congenital cardiac anomaly, a suppressed immune function. This is from birth, palate abnormalities, characteristic facial appearance, hypotonia, which means not enough muscle tone, delayed development, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that it's not very, um, it's not a very good thing to have. But different diagnosis, diagnoses have been made in different members of the same family that have the same deletion. So it makes it kind of complicated. So that means that the presentation of the same genetic changes varies with some things that we don't even understand. So here's Amelie, who's a little kid that has a bad form of, um, of de George's syndrome. And this is a little kid who basically never got off of life support um, while well, she was in and out of the hospital. But this is her at about eight, I think. And then she meets functional medicine. And this is really true. <laughs> so she's an eight-year-old girl, two open heart surgeries, five catheterizations, three angioplasties. This is at eight. So this is, this is all the different abnormalities of the heart, aberrant subclavian arteries, von Willebrand's febrile seizures, conductive hearing loss, blah, 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 reactive airways and all of this. So you see this list and you think, well, this is just exhaustive. Another page of lists. Main thing, frequent infections with 14 hospitalizations for pneumonia. And this is a time when she had pneumonia. And because the rest of her system was so um, beaten down, um, she just couldn't get on top of it and needed total life support. Um, and so by focusing on the matrix, we were able to, this wasn't me. This was, this is um, a clinic near, this is a clinic in Rye, New York that helped with this. Um, by focusing on the matrix, we were able to correct her digestive issues. We all would know how to do that. Decrease her asthma symptoms, help with sleep and restless legs, decrease the number of infections. She stopped having hospital admissions and she actually ended up as an Olympic. Yeah, I mean, it just takes your mind away. So, um, 
yeah. So, I mean, it just it takes my words away, I'm sorry. But the point of this is that even when anybody presents to you, no matter how ill they seem, and you know our society is sort of like, you, get, you have a child that, I mean, it doesn't always come out like this, but you can always start with like, let's heal her immune system and let's, and I definitely have seen this happen. I mean, I think any of us that have practiced this at a level where you have lots of tools in your toolbox, you just start somewhere. You know, you start with digestion, you start with reactive airways. I mean, that was one of her big problems is that she kept getting infections and she couldn't clear her lungs. And so there's all different ways of affecting that. And I really have had lots of people where the, the diagnosis is dire and you, just, you don't do anything. I mean, it's remarkable in some way, but it's, it's just what you know how to do. You don't just don't get overwhelmed by the, by the severity of the illness, just start somewhere. And I think all of our tendency is we still get scared by the fact that it has a long name and that most people don't do well. But the power in this medicine is remarkable. And so that brings me to the, the, back to the idea that in functional medicine, I mean, sorry, in biological regulatory medicine, not functional medicine, that was a misspeaking. Because James and I were saying that a lot of functional medicine people are just doing your genes and their whole clinic has become helping you with your genetic changes, but that's the whole not idea. <laughs> you know, we can't, I, I see that in all these protocols right now for black mold, the same, where they, you know, they have this whole, all of a sudden it's a protocol again, and it's kind of, it's not drugs, but it's the same thing. The whole problem is you have limes or you have mold or you have a genetic, one genetic detoxification defect. And so if you start focusing just on that thing, you've been lost. And that's what this genetic idea is because all of us would like to blame things on our genes. I mean, I think the size of your nose and the color of your eyes, yes, probably we could say that was genetic. Could we change it? That was an interesting thought I had. You know, if I really wanted to change my eye color, Maybe I could, I won't worry with it. But you know, the point is that there's all this epigenetic expression. So I'm just gonna show you, you know, I'm gonna jump around to some things we know. So even with DeGeorge syndrome, this idea of penetrance is that you can have the gene, but then it expresses all different ways. So you don't have to understand this, but you know, there's nothing linear in nature. And so the literature is full of all of this. But I think the most important thing is the idea that not only do we have a genome, that's kind of the basic thing, but we have all these other ways of having genes. So there's an epigenome, which means that there's different ways we can change the expression. And very importantly, there's a microbiome and a metabolobiome. So that means that all of these bacteria in their individuality and all the metabolic processes that are that are caused by bacteria each have their own genome. And so you know now what we're doing is mapping there's of if there's if there, if in one cubic centimeter of intestinal flora, I read it one time, you know, one little cubic centimeter of intestinal flora has more bacteria in it than there have ever been people in the world. So they, they play with these numbers that are crazy. Each have a genetic map in them. And so often what we're trying to do now in a lot of the testing that we do is to map that because that's a wisdom and that gives us another whole piece of information. And, and so you can see that when we start talking about genetics, the reason that we don't get very far is because there's all these different ways that we affect each other. And so these are some very quick examples of that. So we all know what cystic fibrosis it is, it's a, and they call it a single gene defect, but there's 2,000, that means that there's supposed to be just one little piece on this chromosome that maps for that. But now that we're trying to think, well, how can we get rid of that? Well, there's 2,000 variants of the same piece of chemical. So the mechanism is not understood. The mechanism is not understood. Here is one about, we found significant differences. CYP1A2 is an, in, this is an interesting system to map if you wanna get into this at all. But this is about how you detoxify drugs. And um, I have used this kind of thing from a swab on your mouth, I mean, from the inside of your cheek. Each of us have metabolic pathways in our livers that take pharmaceuticals and chemicals and uh, unwrap them and detox them. 
and each of us have the in within normalcy everybody has you know nine different patterns of chemistry and so all of us um, it's useful to know because all of us may need an allopathic drug now and then or our patients do but if you understand that the reason people have side effects we now know why it's because the process in the liver is different from the way the drug company determined that the drug should be um, detoxified so that means that when you put a drug on the market you say it's detoxified by one of these CYA CYP systems and if you happen to actually have that system and it's working then you will have few side effects but if you take the drug and have an adverse effect it's only because you just have a different system and so you should take a cousin drug right but how many of us in the old allopathic way would choose a drug the person failed the drug so you switch to another drug but it's all very blind you know you just keep trying until you get something or the person gives up and goes to a biological physician but I think it's a useful thing because this gives us a lot of information about what is true about the patient that then you can work with I think it's a useful thing if you have somebody that wants to try a drug or is already on six drugs you can tell them why half the side effects are there because this is a very clear map but then they find significant differences in these detox pathways depending on whether they're Swedes or Koreans and so it's you know it's I mean sorry it's it's very complicated it's very complicated so this brings us back to the bacterial microbiome and I'm just going to talk a little bit about this with the idea that this gut has we know now especially after this weekend that it's the bacteria that rule and that the bacteria have a genome and so um, we want to understand so this is with this is a system within a system what are the functions what are the eco, ecosystem services provided by these gene clusters inside this microbacteria and what's really interesting is that this is what is really interesting this is where the geneticists are sort of stuck and what we know is that if we just fix things so that we have like the right bacteria in our mouths and in our guts even if we don't have to identify them that things will get better and there's a lot of information about even cancer drugs and things that if you if you manipulate the genome of the if you manipulate the microbiome people get better and we've known this for a long time it's just nice to see um, it's nice to see that even Nature Magazine thinks about it too. So given our intimate relationships with microbes, sequencing the genomes of our own microbes is essential for understanding the human condition. And this is one of the places where you can get really good information because it informs how to make epigenetic changes, not because it determines anything specifically. And so there's a dynamic interaction between host and bacteria. So this is now from the genetic literature. This is understanding the mic this is understanding the um, the matrix, but they don't know that they understand the matrix. So there's a dynamic interaction between host and bacteria that profoundly affects genetic expression. It's very circular. So metabolites interact with the transcription factors. And intestinal bacteria alter host cellular function. By influencing, by influencing complex net networks. It's a lot of words to say that it really is, um, it really is that the genetics are a little part that we can manipulate by healing the um, system, the whole system. So here are the major influences on individual microbiomes. So of course the host genotype, but then all the rest of these things are things that we already think about and already alter. And there, this slide from, you know, a big serious science magazine is saying that they understand that all of these things affect this genetic um, map that they're trying to make. And so this is just that there's. Um, you know a huge ecosystem that is all one thing from the first bacteria all the way out into space and that it's a really complicated ecosystem that we have to be very gentle to manipulate but by it, manipulating that in the sense of the system we're going to succeed at eradicating disease and so um, you know the whole issue of viral DNA is another another whole kind of can of worms but remember that in, in addition to bacteria there's viruses and funguses in the gut as well already had that slide 
Commensal bacteria control cancer response to therapy by modulating the tumor microenvironment. This is important for us because we already knew that. And even if you don't understand these words, keep doing what you're doing and we'll succeed. So epigenetics is changing the widely linear conception of the genome function. It explains how environmental and psychological influence change the expression of genes. Epigenetic factors change the expression of genes without altering that genetic sequence, but we're spending a lot of time sequencing genes. And so, again, my take on all of this is that the science, that science teaches us that what starts as heresy, we're the heretics. And if you don't want to be a heretic, you probably ought to go. Um, and that, that becomes orthodoxy. So heresy becomes orthodoxy. That's a good bumper sticker. Genetic research continues to be directed by reductionist thinking. Bioregulatory medicine requires us to think differently, to restore regulatory balance to dynamic, complex, and chaotic systems, which is what this genetic mumbo jumbo reads like. And again, it's the environment dummy. So thank you for being here. Thank you guys all so, so much. I know that was complicated at the end of the day.